I think there's massive opportunity for creative directors and CMOs to be part of the BOD and help shape the company at the same time like you know you can represent the customer you're representing our population and having that voice and kind of influencing the company to do better and to do good Welcome to Real Creative Leadership a place where creative leaders can find insights and practical guidance on the day-to-day -day job of being a creative leader. We focus on real issues, topics, and insights of creativity in the business world. Join me as we explore the best strategies for developing your team, getting others to embrace your vision, and generating amazing experiences. This webinar series is produced by The Stoke Group, and I'm your host, Adam Morgan, Adobe Executive Creative Director and author of Sorry Spock, Emotions Drive Business. And this is Real Creative Leadership. Hello and welcome to this brand new episode of Real Creative Leadership. Today we're exploring the changing roles of marketing, both in business and the culture at large. And we have a fantastic guest to help us dig into this topic. Sandra E. Lopez, she is the VP, GM, and CMO of Microsoft Advertising Business, where she's focused on driving effective marketing, position business, and share growth, as well as driving revenue. She's a chair of World Economic Forum, Global Future Council on VR, AR, XR, and many other accolades. And I won't go through the whole lengthy list, but we're just so excited to have Sandra on the show. So Sandra, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Excellent. And we are going to dig into this hot topic. You know, digital transformation is huge and there's all this talk of change. And clearly many of us have gone through the last two years, a lot of change. But we want to talk about a little bit more of like where we think things are moving and how marketing is going to make a bigger impact on both culture and business and everything. But let's start out first, before we even get into all that, we need people to understand who you are and a little bit of your background. So if you can just give us a, a, a little taste on, on your role and how it brought you to creativity and marketing, where you've been a little bit so that we have context of, of who you are. Great, Adam. Well, um, I would like to say that I was uh, born and raised as a Silicon baby um, in the heart of Silicon Valley in the technology industry. And uh, starting in the tech industry, I always had aspirations to be a chief marketing officer. And so in doing so, I tried many different roles and had the opportunity to be both in marketing and business. And what I realized with regards to the world of marketing is that Every single function where you're the CEO, CFO, chief people officer, you have the responsibility to be a marketer as well. And what I mean by that is that really understanding your customer and who you're serving um, so that you create products and services that meet their needs or improve their lives. And so I always like to say that, you know, marketing is often seen as, as a cost center, but in reality, it plays a pivotal role in terms of the overall growth. And I always challenge whether you're like head of sales or head of HR is that if we're here to serve our stakeholders, which has our key constituents is our customers, we all have the responsibility to understand who they are. And so that's really my curiosity in terms of the world of marketing and in the spirit of creativity. And I know, Adam, you know, you're, you're head of creative. I also believe that we're all creative, right? As like little kids, we had to solve problems. It isn't creativity it's just about problem solving and looking at the world from different lenses. And oftentimes I believe that society over time just boxes in that because you draw well or because you're doing the, you know, 30 second, you know, video content, you're the creative person and everybody else is not in reality we are all creative creatures um, and really embracing that so that we can innovate and um, create together, I think is an exciting opportunity. And so I, I think I'm a you know, creator at heart, really from the stem of like, what problems are we seeking to solve and how do we best solve them um, in a manner that understanding that in most oftentimes we have constraints that we have to work under. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. And even though that wasn't necessarily part of our topic today, 100% agree. I mean, capital C creativity is what we all have. It's like human ingenuity. And I think that's a big issue in business today is that they feel like, no, the creative people go over into that corner and you do your thing. No, like the reason why you're on the show is because it's people who like creative leadership isn't limited, limited to a creative director or head of creative. It's people who believe that creativity can impact business and drive it forward end of story. So thank you for ta talking about that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And dig a little bit more into this because when we last talked, you talked about, yes, that uh, 
you know, marketing is a growth engine, not an expense. Mm -hmm. But you also talk a little bit, just tell me just a little brief of your perspective of how it's changed from the 1980s to today, because we're going to talk about not just that in marketing, but also how, you know, boards of directors are going to be changing. But give me some context on, on what it was like in the past and what it needs to be today. Yeah, like, wow, we're dating ourselves back, right? So when we were kids, yeah. what was it? And, you know, you go back and you look at the history of advertising. And, you know, when I was growing up in like the 80s, I just remember, you know, really what the role and as I reflect back and understand like where we've come from was really to like drive awareness. And arguably at the time, in my opinion, it was very transaction based, right? Mm. Um, the notion of were marketing organizations, were they really talking about, loyalty or relationship, I did not believe existed. And, you know, today, the way I view marketing, how radically it has evolved, and this is why, in my heart of hearts, I believe marketing is so strategic to the overall organization and deserving of, uh, of you know, board of director seats, is that if you take a step back and think about our responsibility to the organization, it's about establishing a relationship, right? At the very beginning, we are required as marketers, you know, there's a group that's really intended to woo, you know, your customer. I always like to say it's like, it's like dating, like you <laughs> got to woo that particular prospect um, and really articulate your contributions in terms of how you're going to make their life better. And then, you know, you have to create a compelling reason, like time is our most precious commodity. So why should you like, why should they be attracted to your brand or why should they be attracted to your business? And so that's like, you know, you go the art of wooing and you're dating and then how do you attract them? And then you have to think about the role of once you do have a customer and, you know, driving overall value and building that relationship. And I was talking about like nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to grow that partnership and that relationship that you have with the customer so that they become, you know, committed to the relationship over a very long period of time. So if you think about how many different hats we have to play in the marketing organization from bringing that new prospect in and increasing the overall user value and user growth to increasing the overall share of wallet. To do that, you have to have such a strong understanding of your customer um, and really leveraging all the tools you have to help ultimately kind of, I keep on going and saying like, it's about growing. And that's why I always think about the marketing organizations are about growing and the evolution from what arguably was much more awareness above the line and transaction-based has really shifted to um, marketing as a growth engine, establishing relationships and nurturing relationships over a period of time. That's fantastic. And I, I know that when we talked earlier, it was it's, it's like we have moved into this experience economy. And everything you just said about moving away from just engaging people or engaging customers, it's now all about relationships those relationships are a big part of that are those interactions you have, those experiences you have, the, the connective tissue, right? Right. And so let's talk a little bit more about, you know, exactly how marketing is playing a bigger role in all of that, in creating those experiences and why that's such a critical component to differentiate your business. And it's no longer just about efficiency, but it's about what are you feeling and doing and experiencing together? And then how marketing teams now play a bigger role in everything from social justice to culture. Yeah. I mean, I think to ground everything, like oftentimes we talk about, you know, experience as we go into whether a particular event and how the brand's going to represent, let's say Coachella. And what I would like to challenge our industry at large is, and you talked about social justice, and this is like this weekend, I was giving an example of, because it's a hot topic, right? So you're hearing various different companies take a role on the hybrid work environment, right? It's about our, the employees. What is your philosophy? Are you five days a week? Are you, you know, three days a week and two days? Are you giving your employees the true flexibility so that they can perform and giving the employees, um, empowering them to make the decision? And what was really interesting is I was sitting uh, next to a young kid who's a teenager, 17, and I asked him this question. I go, you know, if you learned about your favorite, you know, Gene brand, and he mentioned it, um, was in the news, and in the news, you know, the company took a position that they want their employees all to work in the office, and, you know, the employees were disgruntled, would you buy a pair of jeans, yes or no? And he's like... Hmm. No, because he's like, that's kind of screwed up. They're not giving the employees the flexibility. So I'm sure I can find an alternate pair of jeans. And so I bring this up because as marketers, we now need to think about 
positions that we're going to take around many different topics and how that is reflecting our brand. You talk about experiences like the brand and experience they're giving to their employees. And as consumers, like we're observing everything. Is that brand aligning to our values? There's so many options nowadays out there. There's no longer like one or two brands in a particular category. There is a plethora of brands and options that as consumers and individuals we can pick from. So as you're thinking about our role, what position are we gonna take around hybrid work environment? How is that gonna affect us? And how is that gonna affect your consumer set? Our position around you know the geopolitical climate i think we have so much more responsibility not only as a growth engine but shaping the culture of our company we as marketing organizations and influencing policy um, and so who would have thought marketing would be playing that type of role and now we are and for many of us, it's new. COVID is something that we've never experienced. We're in the largest global, you know, experiment in our world. Who would have thought? I didn't think we were going to be like in another, you know, war and having to buy a, you know, perspective. This hybrid work environment didn't exist before. So no, we're not experts. We're all learning from each other, and I think um, that's the power of the collective we and learning from and having these type of conversations with you, Adam, so that you kind of take. Um, the best of the best and employ them within your organization. And so you can better serve your employees, um, your customers, and the world at large. I love all of that. And, and it's fascinating to really think about how different the world is today. I mean, if you think you, you brought up geopolitical, and when we think of, okay, in the news, it's not just, you know, one country asking for help from an, another group of countries or from another one, but specifically calling out brands, just like, yes. you know, Tesla, when they were sending out some satellite equipment and it's, you know, we're all watching, the world's watching brands interact with, with geopolitical forces within, right? Yep. Like we're seeing it all come together in real time. And, and that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. But it really tells me like, there's so much more, like, as, as you said before, these relationships, it's because people band together with their tribes, right? And if your brand is part of a certain tribe, then you have to act as part of that and you know, stand up for it and do whatever it is for whether it's you know hybrid work environments or it's going to be you know black lives black lives matter rallies whatever it may be you marketing is so critical to all of that and driving what the brand stands for and what it'll do and what it'll you know how it will react in those relationships with customers that's and I love, so fast I, I totally agree and i love the word that you use a tribe because it kind of takes us back to caveman dies right like survival mm -hmm. and communities and the importance of establishing a community and in that spirit of you're talking about your tribe and who's your tribe you kind of have to take a step back and like constantly check in with yourself and like who are we as a brand? What values do we want to represent? Um, and decisions that you're going to make sometimes at the cost of profit, like what are you going to do? And so I do believe we're entering in a completely different era in which humanity, empathy, and the role of marketing, because I always think about marketers, we're supposed to be, you know, psychologists, sociologists, like psychologists of understanding your, you know, your persona, your customer set, you know, sociologists in terms of the broader society and anthropologists, like really thinking and understanding, like, what are they going through? And sometimes decisions that is not for that extra dollar, but it's for improving society. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I love what I do. And I think it's such a fascinating time and kind of leading these conversations and um, challenging oneself to maybe do things differently so that we do create a better society um, and challenge, you know, our, our business partners that obviously as a publicly traded company, you always you know, are actively seeking revenue, growth and profits. And the question is at what expense? Mm. Let's dig in that a little bit more because you're right. Like it's, it's, if these relationships are important, it's no longer just about profit first, right? Relationships first. So tell us more about, because we talk about digital transformation and everyone says, oh, that's just technology. We're just talking about what, what new systems are you going to put in place to transform digitally? But you've had a different experience at Microsoft where it's putting more of a focus on people. So tell us more about that, of, of bringing it back to the humanity and making that the first priority versus technology or whatever else. Yeah, I kind of have goosebumps because to be fair, I'm five months into Microsoft and I observed from the outside and really admired Microsoft's journey from transformation and the cultural revolution that they're undergoing. And if we can learn, at least if I'm learning anything, is that you can mobilize people for a common good and watching what Microsoft has done in terms of the cultural transformation is pretty impressive. And so at the same time, when you think about um, 
your customers and your people. And if you have a clear mission and vision of what you're trying to accomplish, you can also mobilize a broader community. And like you said, like, a, a, you know, a, a broader tribe to move uh, society forward. So it's having conviction and making sure that your words match your behavior. And I think Microsoft, at least from my observation, and I know a lot of companies going through transformation, but as I compare notes with various different colleagues at various different companies, uh, because of digital, it's not, it's, the technology is an enabler. Mm-hmm. It really goes back to like the human aspects, which I think is the whole irony of things. Like technology is here to make the world better. It is the enabler. It's not the only answer. So you use tools to be more efficient. Um, you use the data to be more informed about your customers so that you build greater products and services. Yet ultimately, any transformation starts at your leadership and the values in which you want to deploy because you make decisions like you're making decisions around data and how are you going to use data you go back to like what are your core values what do you stand for how do you protect you know consumer data um Sacha says this all the time data is a human right and rightly so and if you start to think about these values or behaviors in which you um want to live through it's interesting conversations that happen so you know this notion that digital is technology um, and it's all that tech thing transformation is a strategy and where the company wants to go and you leverage technology so that you can get to that kind of strategy and vision and so um, if used correctly it could be one of your strategic weapons because you're able to move faster more efficiently Um, you get the data to drive insights and make informed decisions there are a lot of similarities between my company, Adobe, and yours, Microsoft, on that whole journey that you just described of, of making that whole, what do we call it, the customer journey, the advertising, the whole process of starting with enabling people and empowering them and giving them the tools to, to be the stars. Right. And then throughout that whole process being like, here's the data, here's the, here are the tools, here are the other elements you need along that whole thing to, to connect with your customers and, and, and make better experiences. So yeah, I think that's spot on from my point of view as well. Yeah, and, I, and it's hard. It's like technology isn't easy. Um, yet, I always like to say like fashion, music, art informs culture and society. Well, now technology is informing culture and society, mm-hmm. both in our personal and at work. And how do you deploy it and know that technology is ever changing? Like who would have thought, I always laugh, we're, we're trying to just figure it out web 2.0 and get our like all data and analytics and BI tools and, you know, you figure it out. And then all of a sudden you have web 3.0. So it's yep. constant. It's constant. And that goes back to like the role of marketing. Like you got to be in the forefront and you got to try and you got to learn things. You got to work with various people that are, you know, experts in their trade and be okay to try and fail because in many cases, it's going to be a first. It's never been done before. Um, but as, as people get like, okay, we figured out web 2.0, you're like, no, you have web 3.0, um, 3D spatial computing on the horizon. And what does it mean for your company? And how do you want to use it from a marketing perspective where it adds value and it's not for gimmicky you know, sake? Oftentimes we want to try things for you know the PR headline. You shouldn't do that. You should do it for... Well, what's in it going back to the relationship with your customer? Why am I going to go into a web 3.0 role? What value is it going to bring to the customers that I'm serving? Yep. Not just you as the company. Yeah, I love it. Well, let me transition a little bit because yeah. we've so far we've been talking about this whole idea of, mm-hmm. idea of how marketing is playing a critical role in shaping not just, you know, cultures at a company, but society mm-hmm. at large. Mm-hmm. But there's still, you know... That was kind of a setup to another argument that we're really going to be talking about here in a minute, which is, all right, but today most boards are made up of operation and finance people. Mm-hmm. And there was an interesting article I shared with you, the HB article, where it was like, all right, let's look you know, at the, at the next CEO or where things are coming from. And there really is this interesting notion where it's like in the 90s, everything was all about that total quality leadership thing, you know, Sigma Chi, whatever it is. And, and there was a real need for more operational leadership. But if we're looking at this future of like, okay, marketing and creativity is really driving all these experiences and really driving, you know, beyond just trying to be more efficient, right? It's, it's more of like those relationships and how do you dig deeper? We're, we want to set up this, this, this argument of saying, well, then why hasn't, you know, boards of directors kept up with where the, tra- the changing needs of, of business are moving? So 
we should have, rather than you know, boards of directors made up of mostly operation and finance, how do we get more people who have more of a creative slant, whether that's a marketer or a creative leader or a designer or whatever that may be, how do we get more of them onto the board? So I'd love to hear your thoughts as I set up that argument. Yeah, I mean, listen, overnight, supply chain officers are wanted in the board of director seat because we realized what happened with COVID, um, how supply chain affected mm-hmm. businesses. Why can't we have the conversation of marketing as a criticality part of the organization? I mean, I, I, it's always, I always kind of laugh when a company is going through financial struggles, what gets cut first? Yep, marketing. Marketing. Yep. Marketing and HR, which I think is like the most fascinating things. Great companies are built by great people. So you're, you're affecting your HR groups. And then marketing as a growth engine, yet you're cutting your growth engine, both, you know, helping attract customers and retain your customers and grow your customers, but you decide to cut that. I challenge our industry. We need to up-level the conversation. We need to talk about marketing as a business and the role in which we play. And arguably, like, we need to probably change our vernacular. I mean, performance marketing, we're absolutely getting there because if for every dollar you can kind of get to mm-hmm. the, the revenue. But I do think we as a community maybe need to change the language that we're using when we engage with the C-level or our CFO. So it's not viewed as that, you know, shiny 50 second commercial that goes in the Super Bowl or considered, oh, we'll go to the marketing department that all they do is pretty PowerPoint slides. Absolutely not. We don't do PowerPoint slides. Maybe the slides are an articulation of our value proposition that is enabling sales to go articulate why our product is better than our competition. Maybe that slide serves as a briefing document to make sure that when the CEOs out there talking to the annual shareholders is representing how we're positioning the overall brand. And so um, I think we get in, we need to get into these healthy debates and for the board of directors to start to realize how marketing drives growth. And I think until we have these conversations, will executive recruiting firms that are looking to um, land people in board of directors or the CEO that's trying to look at their board of director compositions, would they consider, hey, why don't you consider going to hire a CMO or a head of, you know, creative? And I think we have work to do, you know, we have work to do to articulate our role in the business impact that exists should we may not be there. Now the supply chain um, officer uh, saw their role like front and center, whether they'd like the attention or not, but they're the ones who are now getting calls for board of director seats. Yeah, I agree with you. And it really is starting the conversation because we're not saying that we have not been included in the board of directors. No, like CMOs are usually on the boards. That's totally yep. fair. Yep. I think what we're trying to say is if you look at the whole makeup of a board, it leans really heavily to operations and finance. Yep or even the legal counsel. And, and you need those roles, but- And policy now, Adam, I would say policy now because of data uh, policy, right? So policy, people that run policy within, usually it's legal. Yeah. Um, they're you know, part of the composition of the board of directors now is if you start to look at the, the new you know, compositions that are starting to emerge. And maybe what I'm getting at too, because I agree with that completely. It's more of like, if you look at, at how people have trained their brains over the years. Like if, if someone has trained their brains just to look at financial sheets or you know stats and data, like that's one thing, but the problems that companies are facing aren't like, okay, how can we be more efficient? It's how am I gonna address this huge human need of this problem that's just come up in the last month? What do we do, right? And I know you can say, oh, we, we've got people that'll help us make those decisions. But I think what I'm really getting at is there is a difference inherently with someone who has trained themselves to focus on the customer and connect emotionally their whole careers and really understand that empathy and putting themselves in their shoes and creating those experiences. And so having more on the board that have those superpowers versus you know financial superpowers, that's what we're saying, like, let's balance it out a little bit better. But the same token, we're not saying, you know, where, where you said we need to step up in our own uh, you know, departments is true. Like we need to start to learn to speak better with finance and understand some of those other key components because Wall Street is always going to come a knocking and you need to be able to respond to that. So I think yep. that's that's what I've often said to creative leaders is you need to learn to speak the business language. You need to learn to speak, you know, strategy and learn to speak finance. 
And a lot of people want to roll their eyes and ignore that. But I'm like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> the only way we're going to get there is if you can speak that language, but then still bring your set of skills of looking at things through the customer lens, right? And looking at stories and experiences in a different way. So that's, there's got to be a lot of growth on both sides to get there. I 100% agree. And, you know, you're talking about the creativity and just brought a point up is that right now, many individuals, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion, oftentimes anchored on ethnicity, but diversity and inclusion, the heart of it is about diversity of thought. So your point around, when you look at the board of director compositions, it's heavily financial and operations driven. Wouldn't you think about diversity of thought and bringing somebody to your point, like the creative person has been trained by its very nature to look at things radically different and they've honed in that skill, maybe asking the question differently leads to a different strategic direction, right? That the company wants to take. And so, um, I think there's massive opportunity for creative directors, CMOs to be part of the, the BOD and help shape the company at the same time, like help shape what society, like, you know, you can represent the customer, you're representing our population and having that voice and kind of influencing the company to do better and to do good. You'd said earlier that we have a long way to go in that one of the audiences that we need to influence our current boards of directors and current CEOs. And I wholeheartedly agree that we absolutely need to make a case for it and start to have conversations like this, at least to get the conversation up there. And I think another audience that we probably need to look at are um, recruiters, because I can guarantee like when they're looking for the next CEO or even CMO, they're, they're only looking for a specific breed. And it does lean definitely towards, you know, metrics and numbers and, and finance. So how do we get that conversation going? And I, and I guess that's the ask for this audience and, and beyond. Start talking to recruiters. If you're a recruiter, please consider other options for, you know, another position. And if you're on a board of directors, maybe consider something like a chief experience officer or bring someone on that's a new role. Let's just expand the board. There's not like a finite number that has to be there and bring in more voices or ideas that um, are people who have that skill set of understanding, you know, humanity and, 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 and emotions and experiences. You have the executive recruiting firms, you have the CEOs who have a significant influence of who they want in the board of director compositions, um, the BOD people, and then there's the community that are seeking and identifying beyond executive um, recruiters. The, the They're actively looking for the next generation of BOD directors. And for us, you, Adam, myself, we have to allocate time to articulate why this is important. And it's going to take us kind of conditioning the market, just like you're, you know, these are our customers, right? Executive recruiters, the, you know, C CEO, the other companies that are looking at BOD compositions to educate so that maybe it's not going to be us landing it. It's going to be the next generation of giving them a shot. Um, and so, you know, I spend a lot of time not only talking about me as a Latina and um, what I can do for BOD, but me as like a business marketer and what I can do to help drive growth, or you can anchor on something that marketing is really known for is like the digital transformation that we had to go through. Everybody has to go through a digital transformation. And so the value that you can contribute there. Um, so I just say, I always tell my, like myself, like this is just part of an additive part of my job. And mm. it's really to benefit society at large. And maybe you and I are not going to land it but the next generation will if we keep on having a compelling argument to why this voice matters in the board of directors room. Oh, excellent. You know, one last thing I wanted to bring up on that topic, we did some research uh, this last fall. We, you know, interviewed hundreds of creative leaders across the nation. And it was just about careers and understanding what their next step would be and where they would go. And Certainly there were plenty that were like, no, you know, I see a ceiling, this is where it's at. But there was an interesting stat where a third of them had imagined or were planning on not just like waiting for a position on a board of directors, but breaking off and doing some startup where they were the CEO. And I, I've seen a lot of these creator as CEO or as founder of, of a new startup because they're understanding the market, they're understanding customers and moving into a place where it's, you know, it's a better customer experience. So here would be my, my one thing to current CEOs and boards 
it's better to get someone on your board now who understands that rather than have some other company completely, you know, disrupt you because the creative leader has moved off and started, you know, a better experience with a better relationship. So better to do it now rather than lose to a competitor. That's my thought. It's just like, let's get someone on the board and, and have them be a partner. Arm and arm Amen to that. I agree. I 100% agree with that. Oh, excellent. Well, anyhow, any last advice that you'd have to help other, you know, marketers or other people to help start these conversations or continue, you know, kind of pushing better experiences for, for all companies and all culture? I mean, I think we like, you know, Adam, Adobe has, you guys have a conference, Microsoft, we have a conference, you know, the advertising industry, Khan has a conference, like, why don't we look at ourselves first and challenge the content, the programming, and talk about the role of marketing playing at a larger level, and uh, challenge, you know, the industry conferences, it has to start with us, because if we're not talking about it, then obviously, why would the BOD and why would these executive recruiters talk about it? So, I would challenge us for the coming, you know, closing out this year and going into next year, let's get this topic on the programming, similar to how maybe five years ago, we got diverse inclusion as part of a topic that you see it in every single conference. Yep. Let's get let's get marketing as a business and why we deserve a BOD seat within our industry. And let's see how far we can go collectively together with our tribe um, to land some of our talented, you know, community art directors, creative directors, CMOs, on BOD seats. Wow, oh, that's a great suggestion. I love it. We've got the data. I'm sure we've got plenty of-, of uh, We got the data, we got the conference. Yeah. So Adam, like yeah. if anything, you it's and I good. are gonna take it on and it's gonna start with us. That's oftentimes, you know, I tell people change starts with one. So, and get the flywheel going. So we will talk about this offline and look at our upcoming um, conferences and see how we can make this happen. And, you know, Adam, like, if I can make it happen on my side, I will actually, I'll have, I'll invite you and let's continue, mm -hmm. let's continue the dialogue and see, let's track the changes and see if we can, we can drive change together. That's brilliant. I'm going to write a note right now. Yep. Well, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So as we're ending here, let, let first let our viewers know and listeners, like how do they follow you or your career? Where can they find you? What channels are you on? Where do we learn more about you? Yeah. As marketers, I think we should be on all channels. So you can find me anywhere <laughs> and everywhere. Uh, LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, probably the easier one from a business perspective. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Snap, learning them all. So, and I'm on email and I'm on phone. So if you want to connect with me, there's multiple ways. Start with LinkedIn and we can go from there um, and look forward to continuing the dialogue with the community at large. Excellent. Thank you so much. And as always, you can always find us at realcreativeleadership.com. We have a full catalog of past shows and, and sessions and episodes that you can go back and watch. Uh, you can always find and follow Real Creative Leadership on all the major channels, like you said. For sure, we're mostly on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, you can also find me, my website, adamwmorgan.com. We're on LinkedIn. And you can learn more about The Stoke Group, the digital marketing and content agency that produces this show at thestokegroup.com. We'd love to invite you all to connect or engage with us in some way. We just set up this big idea of, you know, go out to your events, people, talk to them about getting this topic on, on the, uh, the agenda. You can like or share this episode with others to get things moving, post a comment or a question on social media. We love hearing from all of you. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you on our next episode. Thanks for listening to Real Creative Leadership. I'm your host, Adam Morgan. This series is produced by The Stoke Group a full-service digital marketing agency that specializes in content marketing, video, and interactive experiences. If you're looking for a partner to build a strategy and content that delivers, visit thestokegroup.com and connect today.